So, hello everybody. Um, so, I'm the Bibliometrics Manager for Wiley, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about defining and measuring impact. Now, as a bibliometrics analyst, um, I, like many of you, work every day with the data behind the metrics. And when a friend of mine returned from the Amsterdam 2AM conference, um, the Altmetrics conference, um, the other week, she said something to me that really resonated. She said her take-home message was, don't look too closely at the data and be wary of ascribing too much value and too much meaning to any of the metrics. So one of the questions we've really got to tackle, and I think this is a difficult one, as has been spoken about through many of the talks today, is what exactly does, does impact mean? Everybody has a different way of describing impact. And when we're talking specifically about quantitative metrics, we need to really pin down what those metrics are really showing us. I mean, words like impact are all very well, words like quality are all very well, but the metrics show very specific things. So, for example, citation metrics, they don't show quality. They show the level of impact that a paper has had on published academic research. Usage metrics, again, don't show quality. They show they're a measure of popularity, a measure of readership. Alt metrics, also not a measure of quality. They're a measure of the extent to which a paper is discussed on social media platforms. And there are many things that you have to consider when you're dealing with quantitative metrics. You've got to consider what external factors can influence these metrics. You've got, to, uh, you've got to consider what do the metrics really measure. You've got to work out whether the metrics can be compared. Even if you're using the same metrics, can a general impact factor be compared to another impact factor? Can article level metrics compa be compared to the metrics of another article? Can usage metrics of different journals be compared? And can citation metrics be compared to alt metrics? You've also got to consider the application of these metrics. What can a journal level metric really tell us about the quality, so called, of the contributing paper or even more, the contributing author? And finally, although probably not finally, if I'm being honest, can the underlying data set be trusted? We're all increasingly using these vast data sets um, to try to quant quantify or qualify different types of research, but a lot of people don't really scrutinise the data sets that they're basing their assumptions on. Um, one of my favourite quotes is actually from um, Lang, who says that, um, I think it's a poor statistician uses, um, uses statistics like a drunken man uses lampposts for support rather than illumination. And I think that is as true today as it's ever been. Um, I think particularly um, today with so much pressure on journal editors, on publishers and on individual researchers, there have really been a proliferation of slightly dodgy metrics to try and offer a strange sort of validation um, to academic research. And one of the things I get asked a lot is how can you distinguish the good metrics from the bad metrics? My answer is generally, um, to paraphrase... Um, to paraphrase Harry Potter, um, naturally, you've got to. Um, J.K. Rowling says that you should never trust something that can think for itself if you can't see where it keeps its brain. And the same thing goes for data sets. Never trust a metric if you can't see where it keeps its brain. First thing you've got to do is find out where a metric is drawing its data set from. Is it being drawn from a citation index? Is it being drawn from um, a social media website? What are the parameters of the data set? And what is the quality of the underlying data set? How is the data being collected? Also, what is the content selection process? Is it something like an autonomous citation index, like Google Scholar, indexing everything from key websites? Is it selective content, uh, selective content based on um, peer review or other, other features, um, such as Thompson Reuters or Scopus? Um, is it a robust selection process? What assumptions are made by the metric calculation? So, for instance, you take something like um, the H-index or the impact factor or alt metrics. What assumptions are being made? 
um, things like the completeness of the data set, the universal availability of social media, the universal availability of internet access. And how exactly do these assumptions influence the use you make of the metric? Next, can the metric be gamed? And if so, what steps are in place to prevent this from happening? And finally, stripped of rhetoric, what does the metric actually mean? So there are many different examples of metrics, all measuring many different things, some measuring journals, some measuring institutions, some measuring academics. Um, as we've heard today, many governments and funding agencies measure academic performance uh, using metrics like research output, like citations, and also other metrics as well, such as peer review, and increasingly looking at other forms of um, publication output. But I still daily hear horror stories, um, academics being judged on how many pub papers they've published in purely science and nature, how many papers they've had published in journals with an impact factor of over five, taking absolutely no consideration of the discipline of the, um, of the academic or the papers being published. So first of all, consider, as I said, the data source. Um, is a citation index used for citation metrics? What other data sets are being used? Does it have even discipline and regional coverage? It's not always the case. Are academics being ranked according to article level data or according to the rank of their um, publication platform, as in the rank of the journal, for example? And if the latter, what types of media are being included in the rankings? Are they being looked at for their journal articles only? Are they being um, assessed according to their book publications, their influence on policy documents, their data sets, their blogs, their books, their patents? There are a whole range of publication media that don't get counted in traditional metrics. There are also, again, as we heard earlier, other aspects of an academic's work to take into account. Um, things that um, academics do, such as reviewing papers, teaching, administration, as we heard earlier, that by traditional citation metrics um, and even other, other metrics, such as alt metrics, are not being taken into account. And when academics are being ranked according to these, which they still are in some areas, in some regions, um, those aspects of an academic's work get pushed to the sidelines. If an, ac if an academic is not being ranked on their, the entirety of their job, the aspects they're not being ranked on will be essentially ignored or overlooked. And that will lead me on to um, what are the potential consequences of ranking academics if you're not ranking the entirety of their performance? What is going to be the eventual impact on academia as a whole? And you've probably seen that, seen that cartoon earlier. I do love that cartoon. So um, there are many types of author rankings out there. The one I hear of most often is the H index. I really love the H index as a metric. Not. Um, this T-shirt, by the way, is actually available for purchase. Um, my H index is bigger than yours. I've also seen one that says I have a huge impact factor, which I also particularly like. <laughs> so for those who don't, don't, who don't um, know the calculation behind the H index, it's based on the idea that an academic has an H index of 10 if they've published 10 papers with a minimum of 10 citations each. Seems like an absolutely fine idea until you start to dig into the intricacies of the calculation and the assumptions behind it. So, for instance, there is no defined citation database for it, which means you can calculate an H-index in Google Scholar, in Scopus, in the Web of Science. No problem, a lot of people seem to say. But the trouble is, these databases only count a citation if they index both the cited and the citing article. Now, Web of Science is very, very selective in the journals it indexes. It's got a much, much smaller number of journals than Scopus. And Google Scholar indexes pretty much anything it finds. Okay, no one can actually map the entire size of a Google Scholar, which means that if you calculate your H-index in Google Scholar, you'll get a very different result to if you calculate it in the Web of Science. There's also no defined citation or publication window, meaning that older academics or academics who've been there in their careers for longer get a really quite significant advantage. There's also no secure way to identify unique authors, at least not until um, things like ORCID, um, author identification, becomes commonly used. And just to really have a think about exactly how fair this sort of metric is, Academic X publishes 20 papers in a 40-year career. His or her H-index is 10. 
Academic Y publishes nine papers in a five-year career. Even if every single paper receives a thousand citations, their H index can't be higher than nine. Okay? And taking all of this into account, lots of academics still put their H index on their CV to be, to be used or considered in hiring decisions, in funding decisions, and so on. And really, I would be slightly annoyed if I put my H index on the CV after calculating it in Web of Science, someone else got their job because they calculated it in Google Scholar and just didn't specify the source of their information. So all of these problems with citation metrics in particular um, led a few years ago to the Dora Declaration, which I'm sure most of you have heard of. Um, so it came, they came up um, with the statement that the impact factor is increasingly used by funding organisations, institutes and governmental bodies to compare research output at an individual or institutional level. And they don't consider the limiting factors of the metric. So they suggested that we should stop using journal metrics to evaluate individuals. Fantastic idea, I couldn't agree more. And also when assessing research to consider all research outputs and to consider a range of different metrics, including quantitative metrics of research impact, influence on policy, and so on. Essentially, to use a basket of metrics. To nick someone else's phrase. They had specific guidance for publishers to stop promoting the impact factor or balance it with other metrics. We tend to go with the balancing it with other metrics because, quite frankly, our authors and journal editors demand impact factor promotion from us. Make available a range of article-level metrics to ensure that there is a shift um, uh, towards the assessment on the scientific content of the individual ar article rather than just the journal it happens to be published in. And they also included um, a rider for open access content, which I'm not entirely sure. It doesn't seem to fit quite with the rest of the Dora Declaration. Um, so moving on to uh, looking specifically, again, at citation metrics. Sorry for the wait on citation metrics. It's what I deal with every day. I tend not to be able to escape from them. Um, citation metrics, uh, as I said, measure the reuse of research within the published academic community. And quality is assumed by the understanding that citing a paper means it's had an impact on your research. But there are many, many factors that influence citation metrics. So things like the discipline, we mentioned earlier, there are vastly different citation rates within different disciplines. You cannot compare the citations of a paper published in cell biology to the citations to a paper published in history. There are different practices, there are different um, publication behaviours within the academics of each community. You've also got to cons consider the discipline coverage in each citation index. For instance, arts, humanities and social sciences titles are quite underrepresented in the web of science, much more evenly represented in Scopus. So you've also got to consider, if you're looking at those sorts of disciplines, which database you should select. Also, research type. It's all very well to weight your metrics by a subject category, but the trouble is, review papers receive far more citations than non-review papers, than standard articles. Um, and that doesn't tend to be taken as much into account. Um, so, for instance, if you go into the journal citation reports, nine times out of ten, you'll notice that the top-ranking journal in the journal citation reports is a review journal. Um, and there's not really much account taken for that. Also, uh, publication date. Of course, older papers have been around longer. They'll get more citations. If you don't set um, a citation window or a publication window to your metric, what does it really mean? You've also got to take into account citation ma manipulation. And this is something that affects all metrics. One of the big complaints against the impact factor is it's very easy to game it. Um, and that's pretty undisputed. It's very easy to game um, citation metrics. However, it is also easy to game alt metrics. It's also easy to game usage metrics. Providing these other metrics does not remove that threat. And then there's also the question of whether or not open access influences citations. Um, in my experience, if you ask someone who publishes in open access, it does. If you ask someone who doesn't publish in open access, it doesn't. Um, I am slightly doubtful. I think Phil Davis did a very good analysis, um, an ongoing analysis, um, showing a slight correlation, but he said it's more likely to be due to increasing um, funder mandates to open access rather than any actual influence on op um, from open access. It's one of those wonderful situations where correlation is not necessarily causation. 
Okay, so um, I mentioned earlier, I think we'll probably skip most of this, but uh, mentioned earlier the different data sets, sort of relative size of the different databases, the Web of Science, Scopus, and Google Scholar for the citation indices. Um, just to give you an idea of um, exactly how, how disproportionate it is, how unfair it is to count citations from one database to citations from another. Um, looking at the question of citation manipulation, um, there are two key ones that get discussed a lot at the moment in the academic community. Uh, Self-citation, which is the one that almost everybody's heard of. The practice of, of um, a paper in a journal citing other papers in the same journal. Um, gets a lot of press coverage every time the impact factors come out, everyone seems to rediscover it. Um, but there's also citation, static, uh, citation stacking, which is getting more... Um, Notice now the practice by which certain journals donate citations to another journal. Um, this is often taken to be evidence of citation manipulation. It's not always. It can occur quite naturally. And unfortunately, sometimes journals can be um, victims of this. Um, so, for instance, um, one journal editor commissioning a special issue and loading it with citations to their journal can mean a journal gets excluded with absolutely no input of their own. Um, another instance I saw was um, a group of authors extensively self-citing their own research and got three journals kicked out of the JCR for it. So be very wary when um, using the word um, deliberate uh, manipulation when journals get kicked out for these things. Um, skip that one. Um, other metrics, um, so I'm going to talk quickly about usage metrics. I know we're running low on time. Yeah, sure. So usage metrics. Um, there are lots of different types of usage metrics, full text downloads, access denied reporting. Um, you can look at cost per download. There are also problems here, though, um, due to um, standards. Um, Counter have been very good at imposing standards on usage reporting, um, but there's still, um, for, um, for publishers that aren't counter compliant, there are still questions on what counts as a full text download, what, what um, downloads should go into a cost per access calculation? Do you include open access journals? Do you include journals that have um, a post two year embargo and so on? And there are also other factors effect affecting usage metrics. So um, do you, what happens to web crawlers and bots? So for instance, there's a, hu um, a huge uh, increase in uh, usage on open access papers. Absolutely, but an awful lot of that usage is also crawler usage. So you've got to know when to exclude for, the, exclude for the crawlers. You've also got to take account of the matching IP ranges. So you get IP overlaps, which can cause huge problems with usage reporting. There's also the question of promotional and self-usage. And how um, exactly where do you draw the line? When does self-usage become um, an attempt to inflate your metrics? It's very, very easy for anyone in the know to write a little macro to automatically download your own article half a dozen times. Exactly how can you exclude that sort of usage? Thank you. And moving on very, very quickly to altmetrics. Um, so altmetrics measure the extent to which an article is discussed in the online community. Um, so it um, looks at um, the number of mentions an article has received, weighted by the source of the mention and the profile strength of the mentioner. Um, but again, these can be easily gained. Um, there are lots of companies that deal with alt, uh, there are a couple of companies that deal with alt metrics they don't all follow the same calculation you've got to know um, how those calculations vary so for instance um, the Mendeley counts in altmetric.com uh, ignore al articles which have only Mendeley usage but nothing else reddit counts in altmetric include only the post Legato um, counts all um, comments and so on so there are differences in the ways that altmetrics are being calculated and as we mentioned earlier there's a NISO group to establish a code of best practice but also with the gaming, um, you can actually purchase, um, purchase tweets for your articles. And how do you exclude that? And at what stage does this become gaming of your alt metrics? Can they be excluded? And if they can't be excluded, how does this sort of make it um, better or fairer than other journal metrics? So further considerations, last slide, I promise. Um, so alt metrics, fantastic. They give you more immediate, me um, immediate measures than citations. Um, citations do take a while to build up. They're not reliant on inclusion in a particular index. They're very diverse tools for me measuring readership and engagement. But there are difficulties with standardization and data capture. How should the different types of alt metric be weighted and compared? 
And how can we distinguish between genuine traffic, advertising and self-promotion? There's also the question of unevil, un uneven distribution of global internet access leading to distortion, particularly for regions such as China with um, particular embargoes on social media. And lastly, what are the likely characteristics of articles that achieve high altmetric scores? This is one of the highest scoring papers this year. I'm sure um, some, some of you will have heard of it. The Am I Normal pa paper from um, the British uh, uh, BJU International um, achieved a massive altmetric score. Not saying that it wasn't um, a very good quality paper, it absolutely was, but um, I don't think most of the people who were tweeting about it were tweeting about it for its academic merit. Okay. So I just want to leave you with this thought. There are lots and lots of different things that we can measure, um, lots of different metrics. We have the citation metrics, we have usage metrics, we have alt metrics. There are also the more quantitative metrics. Um, you can look at um, author surveys, peer review. Um, you can also look at things like submission statistics and go into advanced network analysis to try and understand your academic community. But I think the real take-home message here is that there are all sorts of metrics that you can use. What story do they tell? How do they help you understand the academic environment? It's always dangerous when you try to rank things by metrics. Metrics should always be used first and foremost to understand, your, uh, to understand the community, not to try and limit them. Okay. Sorry.